be using this as a way to help people think about how you evaluate or how you may integrate an evaluation into your planning for a particular uh, program. I, I, and the, the suggestion is that um, we think, our experience is that, uh, um, welcome Anna McTeague. Um, um, really invite others to, to add their names, if, if they will, willing. Um, but I was coming back to saying that th this is an opportunity to think about, think long term about uh, the uh, way in which, as you design a program, you can also um, build in evaluation. And I would say that, that, the, that the quality of the conversation that may take place as you build a, a logic model really helps to often really helps to bring all people onto the same page and improve implementation and increase the ideas for it. Uh, welcome, uh, Deborah Lantang. I'm not sure I'm uh, pronouncing your uh, name quite correctly, but from the Department of Education here in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, this is Andrew Seeger here. I'm the uh, facilitator for the Urban School Improvement Alliance. And in about a minute or two, I, I will begin this session. I will be uh, uh, moderating it. But we really encourage you to, to just try the chat, at the very least, to uh, yourself, and as I said, uh, it will be an opportunity for you also to ask questions and to communicate other uh, aspects or other concerns or interests you have throughout the, throughout the workshop. We were, like, we're going to try and make this uh, as interactive as we can. And uh, one of the ways to do that is, is for you to use the chat. So at the very least, uh, try it out. I see many are, are uh, typing in, and I look forward to uh, Massachusetts uh, Marsha Mitnacht. Uh, Thank you. And if anybody else can add and say where they're from, most appreciate it. And uh, I think with that, we're going to begin. So welcome to this Skill Builder Workshop on Logic Models to Support Program Development and Evaluation in Urban Districts. Uh, it's presented by the, a regional educational lab. And the US Department of Education, Institute of Educational Sciences, funds 10 regional educational labs whose role is to help states and districts use research and data to inform policy and practice with the goal, the long-term goal, of improving student outcomes. So that, and the Re Regional Education Lab for the Northeastern Islands is one of those. It serves New York, New England, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, but with sessions like this can reach across the nation. We work, however, primarily through eight alliances, and uh, these alliances are listed on this slide. Uh, and this particular workshop presentation is sponsored by one of those, the Urban School Improvement Alliance, which works with mid-sized urban school districts. As you can see, here's your list. And uh, the range of topics is extensive. Um, two are specific to the region, a particular region, sub-region, but the rest uh, cover multiple states and have multiple different types of membership. Uh, the Urban School Improvement Alliance itself, uh, these are its goals. As you can see, it focuses on research and capacity building on data use and school performance, and attends to the social, organizational, and instructional context that influence performance. So it's, uh, and, uh, so it's, it's a really dynamic group. Uh, this is a list of the members. I uh, just wanted to inc include those make sure that uh, you have an 
an opportunity to see the different districts that are represented here. Uh, but I'm not going to spend much time on that, as I'm going to now hand over to Karen Shackman, one of the session co-facilitators, who will begin by reviewing the agenda for this workshop. Karen, it's up to you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm so glad to see folks joining in. And it looks like we have a very diverse group. Uh, Shayla and I will be taking us through the workshop today. Um, and to start off, I just want to review the agenda. So Andrew has welcomed us. Uh, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you our goals for the program today. And then I'll turn it over to Shayla, who will introduce the cases. If you have not yet downloaded the, the workbook that is in the bottom left corner in the downloadable files, do that now because we'll be asking you to take a look at those cases if you haven't had a chance to do that. Um, then we'll get right into talking about logic models, what they are. I'll, I'll provide some overview of logic models, and then we'll get into the bulk of the workshop, which will focus on the different elements of the logic model and walk you through different pieces of the logic model um, and invite you to do activities. We're really trying to push the limits of the interactivity that we can have via the webinar uh, environment, and so we're going to ask you to be active uh, during the workshop today. And then we'll get, uh, I'll pass it back to Shayla, and she'll talk about the logic, the overall logic in logic models, and then we'll close out with some time to think about next steps and what some next steps might be for you as you move forward with this work. So first, let me take you through what our goals are for today. So. Our goals are really to introduce the idea of a logic model as an effective tool, not only for evaluation, which is often what people think about with logic models, but also for program and policy development and design, uh, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Uh, as I said, we're hoping this will be very interactive, so we will walk through the different elements of the logic model and ask you to practice some of those elements. And finally, we want to provide some guidance in what some next steps might be for you if you're interested in, a build, in building a logic model uh, for your own uh, program or policy. Now I'm going to turn it over to Shayla to talk us through the cases. Thank you, Karen. So as Karen mentioned previously, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of case examples that are in the workbook. Um, hopefully um, you have downloaded the workbook. If not, um, on your, you know, the left-hand um, corner, there should be, you should be able to download the workbook. So we'll, we will be referring through these uh, examples throughout the webinar for some of the activities that you will be participating in. And the actual cases are on page five of the workbook. And one case is about a college readiness high school program. And the second case is on blended learning schools. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a short activity. So first, I would like for each one of you to please choose one or both of the cases that are on page five of your workbook. Now, once you've chosen the case, read it quickly if you haven't already done so. And I would like for you to do two things. First, list the goals of the program or policy. And secondly, think about what might you want to know more about this program of policy. So consider questions that may come up about implementation, its effectiveness and impact. So I'm going to give you two minutes to work individually to complete that task, and then we'll come back and have participants report out in the chat box on what they came up with. So right now, just list the goals of the program of policy, and then think about what you may want to know more about this program of policy. So I'll give you two minutes to do that. Okay, so if everyone can come back, and if you can um, input and type in the chat box on what, you know, enter your ideas in there about the goals of the program or policy um, in regards to either the cases that are on page five of the workbook, um, either the college readiness high school program or the blended learning schools. If you can start um, just typing in what you think the goals of the programs are. And then what are some things that you might want to know more about that program or policy? So I see that uh, a couple of people are, are typing in. We'll just keep 
people a couple of more seconds to see if um, people are. Oh, so I see here that increasing college access and enrollment for poor students. That's definitely one of the goals of the College Ready program. Increasing attendance and college attendance among low-income students is another one. That's great. Now we have one here. Um, the goal of the blended learning is to improve student achievement by individualizing instruction. So what, what might you want to know more about these, these cases? Another good question by Whit Johnstone, is blended learning model more efficient or more effective? That is a good question to ask and, and wanting to know more about, you know, is this model going to be effective for, for those group of students for that district? This is another interesting one. Are these students first generation students in regards to the college ready program? That would be another question to know, to see if, if that's the target audience that this, this program is, is trying, to, trying to achieve and, and trying to tap into. Another person here would like to know the data on the low income student college attendance. Yeah, we would definitely want to get get some more information on the data, that would be interesting to see what type of data this program is collecting and, and what type of data they have. Another good one, what was the college attendance rate prior to this program and how much is significant? Yes, it would be great to know sort of, you know, what, what was the college attendance rate and did this program, is, is it affecting that, that attendance rate and increasing it? due to the program. And this is one of those things that it's great to try to develop sort of this logic model and, and, and get to that point where you would want to see college attendance rates increasing. That's another great point. All right, so I see that people um, really got into this activity, but you know, in, because of time, we're going to run. And uh, you'll see a map here with thumbnails. And the idea here is that a logic model is really meant to be a map, um, a map for you about where you want to go, uh, the pathway to get there, and some markers along the way. So that's the basic idea of a logic model. That's one metaphor that we use. Another is that of a frame, or you see here the picture of the, the frame of the house. And in this case, the idea is that the logic model really undergirds the work that you do. It provides a framework for planning, for implementation, for monitoring, and for evaluation. Uh, a logic model is often thought about as a theory of action. And one of you, when you registered, posed the question about what's the relationship between logic models and theories of action. And really, a logic model is a graphic representation of the theory of action that guides your program. Um, it's, one, it's, a, it's a way to simplify and graphically present in a way that's easily communicable um, the explicit program goals, the structures, the intentions. It includes the key relationships among elements of the program and helps to unveil the underlying assumptions, both about how change happens and about how the goals of the program might be achieved. So those are two metaphors for you to think about, that map and that framework. Logic model really serves as both. In addition to what a logic model is, it's helpful to think about what a logic model is not. Uh, when you have a well-developed logic model, you do have a great start toward program implementation or evaluation, but you don't have everything you need. A logic model is not a fully developed implementation or work plan. It can provide broad guidance about implementation, but you would need further specification uh, via an implementation plan or a work plan. Uh, that a logic model may help you to build, but it doesn't provide you everything. Similarly, while a logic model uh, provides some direction for evaluation, uh, it doesn't necessarily give you, or it doesn't at all give you an evaluation plan. It is the, one of the steps that many evaluation plans use to get to uh, an evaluation plan. But again, you need to do more work to move from a logic model to an evaluation plan. 
Uh, very briefly, there are different types of logic models. And on the page 9 of your workbook, you uh, can find a little more information about this. The idea behind these different types is the emphasis is somewhat different in these different types. Um, a theory approach model is one that is most useful for program design. It's the most conceptual. Uh, it's kind of the big picture one. It's often the kind of logic model you might see in a grant application. It's broader strokes. An activities approach model is one that really zeroes in on the activities, uh, the relationships among different activities, the sequencing strategies. Um, and that is the kind of model that's most effective for program management or monitoring and implementation. And finally, as not surprising, the outcomes approach model is the one that's most effective for evaluation because it connects the resources and activities to the types of results and outcomes, and it breaks out those outcomes over time. Now, all logic models have many of the same elements, uh, but the, the question here is the emphasis. Where do you put the emphasis um, when you're thinking about what your audience is for the logic model and what the purpose is for the logic model? I hope we've gained a little time by me going quickly um, to catch up. So before we get into the elements of the logic model, uh, I just want to, to spend a little more time talking more broadly about the logic model. Here is a very simple picture of a very simple logic model. Um, and they can look many different ways. In the workbook, you have some examples of models in the back, as well as links to uh, places that you can look for uh, additional logic models. Um, but basically, there are these different elements. And we're going to spend a good period of time going through the elements. Before I do, however, I just want to talk about logic models in their simplest form. So in its simplest form, a logic model is a graphic representation of the relationship between inputs, outputs, and outcomes. So the inputs are what is invested in the program. Uh, the outputs are uh, the program strategies and activities. And the outcomes are what results, as a, what results out of the applying the resources and engaging in the activities. Uh, and I want to give just a, a short example to help you think through this a little bit. So I want you to imagine that you have a headache and you want it to go away. That's your problem, this headache. So the input for that headache would be the resources that you would use. You might have water, a hot compress, aspirin, a quiet room. Those would be the resources. But you have to do something with those resources. And that's the output. So what do you do with that quiet room? Maybe you sit in it for a few minutes. Or you drink that glass of water and you take those aspirin. Those are the actions you do with your resources or your input. And then the outcome. So the outcome may be as a result of applying the input as you do. Um, you may feel more relaxed. You may be hydrated. Your headache goes away. A longer term outcome may be that you're able to go back to work or go back to what you were doing. So that's just an example to think in most simple terms about inputs, outputs, and outcomes with a logic model. We have an example here, thinking again about the blended learning program. Uh, we've pro proposed here some uh, potential inputs, outputs, and outcomes. And you'll see here that the inputs can be a range of things. They may be infrastructure. They may be staff people. We've got the integration staff. They may be um, less tangible, like the willingness or the teacher's enthusiasm for the program. And they may be money, resources, the grants, the technology grants. So the outputs, um, there are the things that you do. So it may be that you complete an infrastructure audit, or the teachers participate in professional development, or you establish blended learning classrooms. That's what you do with your resources. And again, finally, the outcomes or the results. So teachers reported use of diverse instructional strategies goes up. Their student engagement increases, and student achievement uh, on district-wide assessments improves. Again, that's an example for you um, to think through. Now, we have our first poll or our first activity that we'd like you to do. I'm going to move to the activity now. And what we'd like you to do is to think about the college ready case. And what we have here is um, the same set of options for the inputs, the outputs, and the outcomes. And we'd like you to go through and select what you think the inputs might be what you think the outputs might be, and what you think the outcomes are. So again, it's the same choices for each of the three. And we'd like you to sort of figure out which go where. So what are the inputs? What are the outputs? What are the outcomes? And I'll just point out uh, that this is also on page 11 of your workbook. Um, if this is an activity you'd like to do um, on your own at another time, 
uh, we've put it in the workbook as well. So I'll just pause there as I see people selecting and moving across the page. And I can see folks are selecting. I'm just looking at my cheat sheet here, and we'll see in just a few minutes what, um, what we've said are the inputs, outputs, and outcomes, and see how that maps onto what you've put. Just to remind, for the outputs, you want to think about the outputs are the actions. What do you do? So the inputs are what are your resources? Your resources can be um, money, but they can also be people, time, and so forth. The outputs are what you do with that, and the outcomes are what results. So I'm seeing some folks selecting things like the mentors as an output. I would put mentors in the input as something that you do. Uh, I'm sorry, inputs as something that you have at your disposal, um, whereas mentoring of students is something you do. So I'm seeing folks making those choices, moving things around. Um, perhaps while people are still voting because we lost so much time, we should move on uh, because of, unfortunately, that technical glitch. So why don't we move on? Uh, Jenny just on the slide what, um, what we think they are. And you'll see here, for inputs, we have staff, mentors, space and resources, and time, outputs, the courses we provide to parents, the mentoring of students, the guidance meetings, and the student meetings, and the outcomes, parent involvement increases, college applications go up, acceptance go up, goes up, and attendance goes up. So you can see here how we've broken out inputs, outputs, and outcomes. So we are just about on track for our regular time now. I think we've I've run as quickly as possible to get through that. Now I'm going to slow down just a little bit um, to begin to walk us through the elements of a logic model. So the elements of the logic model, as you can see here, there are several. And we're going to walk through each of them uh, and spend a little time. For some of them, we'll have activities. In your workbook, we walk through all of them. Um, and there are activities essentially associated with all of them, although for the online workshop, We've got activities for some, but not all. And we're going to start with the problem statement. So the problem statement is the problem or challenge you face that the program or policy is designed to address. And there are some key questions to think about um, as, you are, as you are generating your problem. You want to think about, obviously, what the problem is. But you also want to think about why it's a problem or what might be causing the problem. You want to think about for whom it's a problem. Is it a problem for individuals like students? Is it a problem for families? Is there a group? Is there a community? Is it a problem for society in general? So you want to think about for whom it's a problem. You also want to think about who has a stake in the problem or who cares whether or not it's resolved. And finally, you want to think about what you already know about the problem through research or experience, um, what existing research and experience might say about the problem. And you want to be considering all of these things as you're generating your problem statement. Another word here, which we'll reiterate later as well, is that you don't want to be generating this problem statement with the door closed in your office. You want to be thinking about this problem statement with the group of people for whom, um, both for um, group of people, both for uh, those who are affected by the program and those who might build the program, maybe even those who would be potential funders of the program. You want to think about who are the folks who should be at the table when you're generating your problem statement. So we have an example here uh, from the blended learning. And in the blended learning example here, we've just taken what some potential sort of bulleted points, potential problem statement ideas could be. And again, this is sort of the brainstorm. Um, and first, you think about the question, what is the problem or issue? So we have here the first two examples. Students are not actively engaged in their learning, and courses are sometimes monotonous. It's fairly clear those are problems. And then you want to think about for whom is the problem. We have here that a key focus here is the problem for students. But you may also want to think about who else might be affected by this problem. So are teachers affected by the problem because students aren't engaged? Are families affected by the problem? So you want to think broadly, again, about for whom it's a problem. And why it's a problem. Again, if you look at this example here, uh, we have a lack of one-on-one -on -one attention from adults and, and uh, courses not being personalized. And it may be that the lack of personalization and, and the pacing being fairly lockstep leaves students not getting what they need academically to succeed in school. 
Um, and then again, you think about who has a stake in the problem. Who might be affected if you could resolve this problem? So the example here um, is not exhaustive. It's just meant to sort of um, illustrate what some of the potential things you might think about as you're generating your own problem statement. Uh, I'm going to move to the next slide. And in just a second, we're going to have you do some thinking about this. Um, but before I do, I want to point out a few reminders or a few things to keep in mind. And I'm using the metaphor here of Goldilocks. And you think about with Goldilocks, you don't want the problem to be too big or too small. You want it to fit just right. So first, it should be targeted and specific. But it's not, you know, it's not everything. It shouldn't include everything that's a problem. You want it to be targeted and specific. But you also want it to be so, you don't want it to be so targeted and specific that the problem statement is almost the inverse of the program that you want to develop. So you don't want the problem statement to read as the lack of the program. With a blended learning example, you wouldn't want the problem statement to be that students lack access to their own computer, you know, their own netbook, and they don't have a unique schedule um, that allows them to go in and out of, of online learning. And that essentially is a restatement of the program as the problem. And you don't want to do that. So you want to find the balance between targeted and specific and um, not restating the program as a problem. So that's just some guidance for you to think about. And now we'd like to um, ask you to think about your own context. We're moving to an activity here. And you see the problem statement pod. We'd like you to take some time now to write in just bullet points on what some of the uh, what some of the ideas you have about a problem that you might be facing for which you would develop a program or an initiative. So we invite you to just write in um, what some of those ideas are for the problem, thinking about those questions again. Uh, what is the problem? For whom is it a problem? Why is it a problem? And just jot down some notes. And you can, I can see that people are starting to write. Again, if you're interested in uh, tracking on the workbook, this is on um, page 13, if you wanted to take notes in your own workbook as well. And again, the idea, I, ha I see multiple people are typing, but we don't yet see what folks are saying. So uh, again, keep, keep on typing. Uh, and we want to have a sense of who's out there and what kinds of issues are you facing for which you might use a logic model. And I'll just pause for a minute to let folks to do a little thinking and typing. And actually, just a word of advice, if you're using the, uh, the typing function, you want to go ahead and hit return. If you have a couple ideas and then you want to pause and think a, more, a little more, go ahead and hit return so we can see some stuff. Hit enter. And then uh, you can keep writing. So I can see there are not enough ninth grade students who pass algebra the first time they take it. So that, if I read that problem statement, I would assume some type of Math intervention would be the program. Students with disabilities are not making academic progress in general education. So there might be some kind of intervention. So again, you use the problem statement. I'm sort of playing a game here of guessing what the program might be. Uh, curriculum is not aligned to the common core state standards. So maybe that's a work with teachers to build curriculum alignment. Lack of career awareness among elementary school students might, yield, might indicate the need for a program that um, does career awareness among elementary school students, maybe a shadowing program or something like that. Enrollment of students in AP dual credit classes. So I'm assuming the problem is a la uh, too little enrollment of students in AP or dual credit classes, and a program might maybe provide additional support for students to take AP, um, increasing enrollment in AP courses by you know, adding an additional course period for support. Because of high stakes testing, teachers feel pressed to address large volumes of content hence rely heavily on lecture. Well, that's an interesting one. So I'm trying to imagine what the program might be for that. I might break that one apart a little bit. Um, but I'm guessing that the program there might have something to do um, with uh, supporting teachers to diversify their instructional techniques. Um, and we've got students attend early college schools, are graduating and deemed academically unprepared for a four-year college. OK, so that's a problem. Um, well, I'm not quite sure what the program would be for that one. Maybe uh, we can hear a little bit more about that. But 
perhaps it's something about providing additional academic support to early college students. Uh, one more I'll look at. School and staff leadership throughout the district inconsistency demonstrate the no inconsistently demonstrate the knowledge, skills, and behaviors associated with effective data-driven decision making. So there I would imagine that the program might be something to help support uh, staff in a district to use data more effectively. OK, so I think you're all getting the idea here. This is great. It's so good to see folks really using our chat to, uh, to, to share some of your ideas. In the interest of time, we're going to move back into the presentation and transition to the next element that we're going to spend a fair amount of time on, and that's outcomes. Uh, while outcomes are not sort of the next item that you would see when you would look left to right across a traditional logic model, um, they are a logical next step to discuss when thinking about building logic models because they sort of serve problem statement and outcomes serve as kind of the bookend for a logic model. Outcomes ask, what difference does it make? So in other words, what is the difference that the resources, strategies, and activities all taken together have on the various participants in these efforts? Generally, outcomes come in stages and fall along a continuum from short-term to long-term to impact. The language to describe these outcomes can vary. And in your workbook, we've provided some on page 13, some other language you might see in logic models. Um, so short-term might be initial, immediate, or proximal. Long-term might be medium-term, intermediate, or midpoint. Impact might be long-term, final, ultimate, distal. You may see all of these um, in a logic model. Uh, but for the purposes of our workshop today, we're just going to use short-term, long-term, and impact. So short-term outcomes are really the most immediate and measurable results that can be attributed to the strategies and activities. Long-term are the more distant results that are anticipated as a result of the collection of strategies and activities. Uh, and just, well, I'll get to that in a minute. And then impact are really these desired outcomes that occur as a result of long-term implementation of the strategies and activities. But these more long-range impact goals are really dependent on some conditions that would go beyond the scope of the program's strategies and activities. Some people talk about these as the blue skies or big picture types of objectives for the program. And they're ones that are more distant in terms of time, but also more distant from the actual strategies and activities, and less within the control of the program or policy to realize. So these are often considered to be sort of much further out. Um, and just a word about time, uh, when it comes to short-term, long-term, and impact, it's good to think about the overall frame of the program, the overall time frame of the program. In some cases, uh, short-term is considered to be within a year. It could be one to three years. Long term could be two to three years out, or it could be four to six years out. It really depends on um, the specifics of the program. And we actually have a couple suggestions about how you can do some thinking about outcomes and how it relates to timing. But here's an example just to help um, illustrate the idea of short term, long term, and impact. We're taking the college ready case here. And a short term impact here, because a short term goal of the program is to um, reach out to parents, so a short-term impact may be, uh, or I'm sorry, a short-term outcome may be increased contact with parents and guardians. So if you make an effort in that direction to reach out to parents, you may see a return on that effort um, in the fairly short term. A long-term goal related to that parental engagement might be that students' attendance goes up and their academic performance increases. Now, you wouldn't expect that just because you've increased contact with parents that immediately you would see that improved academic performance. You might see some attendance improve fairly short term. But um, again, this would be something that you might expect, not necessarily in the earliest phases of implementation, but a bit down the road as the effect of increased parental engagement sort of trickles down. To the students. And then finally, an impact goal of the program may be to increase the percent of students in participating high schools who graduate from post-secondary education. But you imagine that just by the nature of this outcome, this impact outcome, it would have to require more years. So if the students in the program are 9th, 10th, 11th, maybe 12th graders, um, you would imagine that it would be three, four, five years down the road before you would see an impact in terms of graduation from post-secondary. 
Now we'd like to um, sort of show you here a way to think systematically about building your outcome. It's really important that, that in your building of the logic model, um, you're clear and systematic about thinking about outcome development. And the table on this slide is designed to promote a step-by-step -step approach to outcome development. Um, it may seem a little tedious, <clears throat> as you see it here, but the key idea is that we want to try to be as concrete and specific as we possibly can when we're generating program or policy outcomes, because we achieve several goals at once when we do that. We clarify what we really think the program might achieve if it's implemented as we intend. We sketch out our expectations for what will change over time. So again, that's getting at that idea of starting to build a sense of the time frame. And we begin to build some understanding of the type of data we want to collect about our program as we implement it. So it might even suggest something to us about our evaluation. So here are the categories to think about. Who is the target? What is the change desired in what and by when? And we have an example here from the, um, from the, uh, from the College Ready example. And we're moving to the different format because we're going to ask you to do some thinking about this. But just in the example here, we've got high school seniors in three Boston Public School comprehensive high schools that will increase their applications to post-secondary by June 2014. And this is just one goal of a program that may have many goals. So this is just one particular outcome that we'd like to see. And so now with this activity, what we're inviting you to do um, is to think about, and you'll find this on page 15 of your workbook, but to think about um, just one outcome, just one activity, or one, one um, outcome or result that you would like to see from a program or policy that you work on. Think about the target, the change desired, in what and by when. And you'll see we have the outcomes pod here, and we'd like you to write in what a target is. We don't have time to sort of go through um, this for, you know, go through the whole thing. Um, and we recognize that it takes you, you know, a bit of time to think about this. But just let us know what some of your targets are. Um, and I see someone is writing. Uh, don't be shy. Go ahead and just write in what your targets might be. And think again about being as concrete and specific as you can. Thinking about the examples that Many of you have shared already. We know we have folks who work um, with teachers on, on building their data capacity. We have folks who um, work on college readiness, on uh, special education. Oh, we have here teachers and participating public high schools. So that's a good place to start. You might want to think about getting as concrete as possible with this one, Chris, and think about how many teachers and how many participating public high schools. Um, and then you move from there, and then you think about the action verb. Uh, we've got Jill saying that students in junior high and middle schools in District 1, good. So you've got um, students of a certain age in, in a particular district. And then we've got school and district leaders as the target. I imagine that Maureen, that is the example where you're trying to build the data capacity. So you might have school and district leaders um, increase their, uh, and then in the what, you might want to think about how you capture that what. What are the results that you would want to see? Um, in terms of increasing their, their use of data. Mary has a spreadsheet on curriculum planning is aligned with the CCSS K-12. So again, Mary, I'm not sure what you're thinking there. You want to think about the target being, um, being something upon which a change could be enacted. You want to think about that. Um, OK, we've got students with fewer than 16 college credits, urban preschoolers, sixth through eighth grade students who are less than proficient in math. We've got some very concrete audiences or targets for uh, the change we want to see. Ethan has middle and high school students being encouraged to increase STEM interest. So you want to think there, maybe are you targeting a specific group of middle and high school students? You want middle and high school students who are performing not as well in the STEM, in the STEM areas as your target. So again, you want to try to, this is one of the ways in the logic model process that you try to get as concrete as possible about what you're thinking. Um, we're going to move back into the presentation now. Uh, and I'm just going to indicate a few uh, important outcomes to think of, or important uh, guidelines to think about when it comes to outcomes. Um, and there are four here. And this is also in your workbook on page 16. But here are just some things to think about. Um, are the outcomes important? Uh, and when we mean that, we mean do they represent significant change or improvements that are valued by participants and 
key players. So you may have an outcome that occurs that's not important. Um, it may be achievable, but it may not really be worth the effort. So you want to apply this sort of who cares test to your outcome. Uh, an example here would be if you think about the blended learning program. And it could be that because uh, of doing the blended learning program, you change schedules in such a way that students have a longer lunch period. And this may be an outcome directly related to your program. Uh, but it may not be one that is necessarily important to you. So you want to apply that who cares test to your outcomes. Are they reasonable? Are the outcomes from short term to long term to impact connected to one another in a way that, that is reasonable, that makes sense? Is it likely that one outcome will lead to the next? So for example, let's take the uh, blended learning again. And you think about access to online courses as part of the blended learning component. You want to ask yourself, will access to online courses lead to increased student engagement, which will lead to increased student, out, uh, student achievement? You want to ask yourself, is that a reasonable progression? So you want to think about, in light of what you're doing in the program, when and for whom are your outcomes reasonable? Are they realistic? Are the outcomes that you suggest realistic, given the nature of the problem, the resources that you have available to you, and what you do with those resources? So will the program lead to or help contribute to the outcomes that you want to see? And in this, you want to be careful to ensure that given your level, level of effort and the resources that you have, um, the outcomes are realistic. So in other words, here are a few examples. Take the college ready. Uh, if you deliver one parent education class, is it realistic to expect an increase in student achievement? That may be a lofty goal. Um, or if you equip students with netbooks to use, but you don't provide teachers with any training, is it realistic to expect student engagement to increase? Uh, so these are the hard questions about outcomes uh, that you need to ask as they relate to your program and policy, what, or program or policy, what you are actually going to be able to do. And finally, this last one is, is kind of interesting, I think. You want to attend the unintentional or potentially negative outcome. That is, you want to anticipate or consider what could happen as a result of your set of strategies and activities, even though you don't intend it? Um, and you want to think about the potentially negative effects of a program or policy. So for example, could access to online courses lead to lower student attendance? Could that be a potentially negative outcome of your program? You want to consider these unintended consequences, because in, if you're doing so in building your logic model, you're preparing yourself for these unintentional outcomes, preparing yourself as a program, as a group, um, to address these. So those are that's just uh, sort of comes to a close of our outcome section. But I know that the outcome piece is a very critical part and one that you may have additional questions about as we go forward. And we'll have a chance for Q&A in just a few moments. Um, before, though, I want to address strategies and activities. Um, strategies and activities are the program components or the game plan for the program or policy. They're the things that the program does. So in the logic model, this is where you inventory all the activities that have been designed to achieve your outcome. However, it's important that it's more than just the listing of all those activities. So there are two things to keep in mind as you are generating all of your activities. First, to ask yourself is, what is the appropriate sequence or order for these activities? And that's something that is a logic model is very useful for, because it helps you to clarify the order in which things happen and encourages you to think about a logical progression of activities from one to the next. So let's take the college ready case. It may be important that the mentoring elements of the program come prior to the delivery of the parent workshop series, or vice versa, or perhaps they should be concurrent. But a logic model forces you to ask yourself about that and to be clear about that. Second, um, well, related to that actually first, is that you also want to consider not only the order, but also their relationship to one another. So activities are related to one another. And that gets at the second one, which is to think about whether or not there are a set of activities that bundle or cluster to get together. And so that in so doing, rather than having sort of a random listing or a random assortment of activities, you will have a core set of strategies that guide your program. Let's take the blended learning example. Perhaps there are a series of training needs related to instituting the blended learning model. So you've got new professional development offerings for teachers, new demands on technical support staff, 
new requirements for paraprofessional support. You've got all three of these things sort of circling around as, as key, key activities that you do. But they bundle. They really do bundle into one core activity, and that may be called the professional training strategy. So you look at all the different things you do, and you try to think about what are the core strategies that guide our program. Um, this really does help you to streamline your logic model. And it's also very useful when you start to think about evaluation, because therefore you're not evaluating a random set of activities, but you're evaluating your core set of strategies. We have just an example here, again, with the blended learning, where we've shown you a potential chart that you could fill in. And this is on page 18 of your workbook. But this is just um, sort of to illustrate the idea of something that we encourage you to do when you're thinking about. Um, I, I see that someone is asking if you'll receive the slide deck. You can look down on the bottom of the page and, at the downloadable options. And the slide deck is actually there as a downloadable option. We hope that you will download it and use it again. Um, but let me go back to the strategies and activities. Um, again, here we're just illustrating for you an activity that you might engage in, where you think about what's the full list of things we do? What, how do we bundle these into a core set of strategies? And what is the appropriate order or relationship among these? Um, there's another thing that's really important about this that I want to raise before we move on, and that's about this idea of bundling. Uh, many people who work in organizations talk about mission creep this idea that we can sometimes start, find ourselves starting to do things that aren't necessarily core to the mission of our program or our initiative. And one of the nice things about doing a logic model and thinking about this bundling of your core strategies it, is it helps you to identify whether or not you are suffering from mission creep. So let's take the college readiness example. You have a core, two core strategies, let's say, for the college readiness example, parent education and student mentoring. Uh, but then you start doing a series of professional development activities for science teachers. And as you look back to your logic model, as it should be a living document, uh, and you want to refer to it again, you see that this new activity that you've taken up doesn't fit into your core strategies. And there are two ways you can go with that. You can determine that this doesn't fit and we're going to stop doing it. Or you can revisit your logic model and think about an additional core strategy. Maybe your program has evolved such that professional development has become a part of it. Um, so, so just something to think about when you are thinking about these core strategies. Also think about how many are realistic. Uh, let me move on there, but encourage you to address, um, address this part of the workbook in your teams or in your groups and do some of this uh, inventorying and bundling. I see there are a few questions. We're about to get to the Q&A once I get through resources, which is the next. And I want to address some of the questions you posed once we get to the, once we get to the Q&A in the next couple slides. But before I do, uh, the next element of the logic model is resources, or when we were talking about this earlier on, we were talking about the input. These can be material or intangible contributions uh, that are related to helping to resolve the problem that you've identified. Um, so the key idea here is to think about the whole range of resources and really to brainstorm broadly about the whole range of resources that might be available to you to help create the strategies and activities that you've designed to respond to the stated problem. So we have just an example here. And what we've done here, because we think it's easier often to identify those tangible resources, either you have a grant or you don't, um, either you have uh, the technology or you don't, it's sometimes harder to think about what are the range of intangible resources that you have. And so there's an, actually an activity in your workbook on page 19 that encourages you to brainstorm those intangible resources. And so we've given some examples here. You may have volunteer community mentors in the example from the College Ready case, local university space that's donated for the parent meeting, a college admission directors who donate their time for an application workshop with the students. Or you know, student volunteers who, who provide childcare while the parents meet. So these are just the kinds of examples of the types of intangible resources that you might think about um, when you're generating your, your whole list of possible resources that could be applied to the problem. So we're going to stop there and allow for some Q&A. Um, I know there have been a few questions that have been posed. Um, we're moving into Q&A now, and if folks could Actually, because we don't have the Q&A before, if folks could start to write in some of their questions now, 
I will answer one that I recall being posted while I was talking, and that had to do with retroactively doing a logic model. Let's say you've started the program already, it's already enacted, and you decide you want to go back and you want to do your logic model, and I say go for it. There's no reason not to engage in the logic model act process, even if you are already doing it. And I would venture to guess that that's true for many programs, many, many policies. It, it's a real luxury to have the time to develop a logic model before you've even begun implementation. But it's never too late, and it will certainly help you to harness um, some of what's already going on in the program and make sense of it. And it may help you to think about um, critical things like what kinds of data do we want to collect? Uh, what are the core strategies that drive our program? What are the things that we're doing that really don't fit? So I definitely think it's possible and probably likely in many cases that people are retroactively developing logic models. I can see here another question. The examples I've seen have all been one page, but I didn't know if that was standard practice or if they were just simple examples. So that's a great question. So the examples that, um, that Donna has seen have been one page logic models. The idea with a logic model is to try to make it a sim simple graphic representation of the theory driving your program. So I have seen logic models that are very elaborate. Um, and in so doing, they actually, in addressing so much specificity, they actually lose some of their power, I would argue. You should really aim for a logic model that is one to two pages um, and readable with the naked eye. I have seen logic models that can get to be one to two pages, but only if you shrink the font to about eight. So again, you want to think about the goal here is a way to communicate the key, the key inputs, outputs, and outcomes of your program, your policy, your initiative. Not everything needs to be in the logic model. You might go to an implementation plan if you want to get more specific. Uh, that's a great question. These have been two great questions. I'm hoping there are more questions that folks will post. Um, there has been interest um, in thinking, you know, when we talked about um, when we talked about uh, the strategies and activities and the resources, and we don't have specific activities associated with those, um, there may be interest in asking some questions about those. I can see a few people are typing. Um, you know, you want to think across all of these, all of these uh, different elements of the logic model and where you might have questions. One thing that runs across all of them to think about is who you have at the table and who participates in the logic model process. Um, this is certainly, as we said, uh, it's a process, and the process is just as important as the outcome. Uh, we have another question here. Um, let me just finish that thought that, you know, you really want to be thinking about with each of these elements, uh, what are the voices that need to be at the table to ensure that you have uh, the best answers possible for all of the brainstorming that you do, the best answers possible for each of those elements. So someone is asking that it's hard to distinguish between activity and strategy. For example, create partnerships could be an activity, but when bundled with other related activities, it might also be a strategy. Yes, so creating partnerships could certainly be a strategy. It really depends on, on I would suggest actually that what you do is you inventory all the activities. So start at the smallest grain level first, and then try to bundle them from there. And that will help you see whether or not creating partnerships is a strategy, is it a core element of your program, a core strategy of your program, or is it just a piece? You're creating a specific partnership with um, a specific entity. Or are you creating a range of partnerships across several different, across several different entities, student partnerships and parent partnerships and business partnerships? So you want to inventory those activities and then get to the strategies from there. If you run a large program, does it make sense to have a broad logic model or one for each of the smaller components? That's a great question. Um, you know, that would be the kind of question it would be great to talk through. I, I think that you could do both. I think you could have a larger uh, program logic model that maybe would be more at the, um, the theory approach level. You know, we talked about the different types of logic models. You might have sort of a theory approach logic model for the larger program. Because I would imagine that your program has a core set of goals that you want to achieve. And you might want to think about your problem, again, start with your problem and then your outcome for the program writ large, uh, and keep it at the sort of theoretical level. And then maybe with the more specific elements of your program, the smaller components of your program, you have more activity-related um, logic models that are, more, that are closer to the specific activities of those different are there any books or articles about logic models that you would recommend for further reading? 
Well, in the back of the workbook, there are a series of resources um, that you can refer to for more information. Um, we've provided both a list of some of the uh, resources that I think we provided a list of the resources that we drew from. I'm just confirming that in this version of the workbook, we've included them. Yes, we have. So we have a number of logic model resources and evaluation resources at the back of the workbook. So if you haven't yet downloaded the workbook, make sure you do that, because there are a number of hyperlinks there as well, so you can go and find out more. There is a lot out there about logic models. There are lots of examples. There are lots of materials that you can look at. Um, so we hope that this will just be the start for you. Um, and we drew from many of those materials to build this workshop. So on that note, let me see, if, if nobody else has any questions, I think we can probably proceed back into the presentation. And please feel free to continue to ask questions in chat, and we will try to address them if we haven't addressed them already. We're now moving to the final element of the logic model for us to discuss, uh, and that is assumptions. Uh, and I actually really like talking about assumptions. I think assumptions are a really helpful part of the logic model building process and really a part of uh, what makes it a process that you engage in with a sort of cross-section of, of your key players. Um, so assumptions, they're the beliefs we hold about participants, staff, and the program. They're also the assumptions that we have about change or improvement may be realized. So they're both um, the assumptions we have about who we have available, uh, the engagement we have of our key players, and so forth. There are also assumptions more generally about how change happens or how we might achieve the result. And it's important to be explicit about these assumptions uh, as you're considering program design, implementation, and evaluation. Uh, and you want to think about the logic model as a process that involves key leaders, program developers, implementers, participants, and it's the process of generating these assumptions that helps to clarify what's really undergirding, what's really driving the initiative, what people believe about how this initiative will, will work, uh, how the outcomes you desire will be achieved, and how it will sort of all come about. So I want to go back to that example of the headache and, and think about assumptions as it relates to the headache. So you know you had this headache. And you tried a few things to get rid of it. You had these resources. You had water. You had aspirin. And what did you do with those resources? You drank the water. You took the aspirin. You moved to a different room. And the outcome was ultimately that the headache went away. But you have to remember that there were assumptions. Or you have to think about the assumptions that were built into that. Between the problem, which was the headache, and the outcome, which was the end of the headache, there were several assumptions you made about the circumstances related to the headache. So you assumed, for example, that there was no allergy to aspirin. You assumed that there wasn't construction going on right outside uh, the next room so that despite your taking the aspirin and drinking the water, the noise would continue to have the headache, uh, would, would, not, would make it impossible for the headache to go away. So again, these were not explicit assumptions. They were, uh, you did not know everything there was to know about the circumstances, but you made certain assumptions in order to solve the problem. And it's true that you might not have been successful if in fact, your assumptions have been incorrect. So clarifying and making explicit the assumptions behind a program, both in terms of those specific elements of the program and general ideas about how change happens, is really a critical part of the whole logic model development process. Um, one thing to think about is the idea of internal and external assumptions. And I've sort of been hinting at this. The internal assumptions are those about participants and resources and how the program really will function, the day-to-day -day functioning of the program. And then external assumptions are, are the assumptions about how change occurs, the values that are embedded in the program ideas, uh, which may be the result of hunch or previous experience or findings from prior research. So to illustrate that, on the next slide, we've just sort of indicated some internal and external assumptions from the blended learning example. So you see here the internal assumptions we have are about uh, the school leadership. So we're assuming that the participating school leadership will continue to support the program. There's a big assumption there. I know many of you who work in schools know that assuming the support of your leadership is a key piece of, of getting things done. So that's an internal assumption we're making. It's not a given. Uh, another internal assumption we're making 
with the blended learning is that three staff will be sufficient to support the program in three schools. Again, those of you who are working in urban schools know that staffing is a critical piece and having the capacity to do the work that you want to do is critical. You're making certain assumptions about your capacity here, and they are not given, but they are assumptions that you're making as you build the program. There are also external assumptions. So we have these two assumptions here about, first, the, the notion that giving students access to a range of different modalities, to online, to interactive with teachers, to one-on-one -on -one with teachers, to a group setting, all these different modalities, engaging them in the range of them, will increase uh, student engagement. So that's an assumption. We're assuming that mixing it up for kids is going to increase their engagement. The other assumption, increased student engagement will increase academic achievement. We are making the assumption that student engagement will yield results in terms of academic achievement. That, again, is not a given. It may be well-founded based on research, but it is an assumption. So you see here the idea that you generate these assumptions in order to uncover some really critical things about how the program will work and what you expect to see. Um, I want to pause there and ask you now to take a moment to think about assumptions. So we're going to move to an activity pod, uh, and we're going to ask you to think again about your program or policy and the assumptions that you might be making about uh, either internal assumptions you know, related to uh, what you have at your disposal, the resources and staffing that you have, or external assumptions, assumptions you have about how change happens, about how kids learn, about uh, modal learning modalities, about you know, whatever it is that your context is, to think about that and just generate some of those assumptions. Um, and I see folks are writing, and that's great. And we're going to have a chance to look at the kinds of things folks are saying. Um, an aligned curriculum will improve instruction and therefore increase student outcomes. Yes, so Mary, that's great. So I would take, if you were thinking about building this for a logic model, one of the things, this is a, I'm so glad you did this, because one of the things that you want to think about is not, um, not uh, sort of bundling your assumptions. You want to bullet those assumptions. So first assumption is an aligned curriculum will improve instruction. And then you have improved instruction will, will yield increased student outcomes. So you want to sort of break it all apart so you can see kind of the, the logic of your assumptions, if you will. Ethan has building the labs as a prerequisite for increased interest in STEM. So an assumption there is that you need to have the science labs in place before you can increase interest in STEM. So that's an interesting assumption. And that is definitely an assumption that's not a given. Perhaps you can increase interest in STEM without the labs. So again, you see how you uncover some of the guiding ideas of your program or policy by going through this process. Maureen has an internal assumption. We do not have enough resources to provide direct training or professional development to all teachers, and therefore we have to rely on a train-the-trainer model. So there's an assumption there that there's not enough, uh, there aren't enough resources to train all the teachers, so instead you have to train the trainer. Um, and that is an assumption. And it may be a well-founded assumption based on knowledge about what your resources are, but it is an assumption. An assumption is that program participants understand the workshop content. Well, I'm making the assumption, hopefully, that over the course of this workshop, all of you are, are understanding the content. But I think Swathi is probably referring to her own context. Um, and again, yes, certainly, that's an assumption. And one that you would probably want to test um, and find out if it's true. Uh, oh, great. Whit Johnstone has a, a really good assumption here that's one of these external assumptions. It's important for all high school students to take the SAT. Right, so many, and this is actually, I'm glad this one came up, because many times there are certain assumptions that are so sort of, they're such assumptions in education that we don't even state them. And one of the things that we really encourage folks to do in generating assumptions is even to state what you think is obvious. So, you know, for example, the assumption that, that increasing student enrollment in AP courses is a desirable um, thing for a school. That is an assumption. And it may be that in a, in a program where your objective is to increase student enrollment in AP courses, you don't state explicitly that assumption. And part of the process of building assumptions is to really make explicit what's implicit. So let's look at one more or two more. Um, Individualized teacher coaching will increase child outcomes, Sarah has said. Yeah, so there's an assumption there that the way to increase outcomes for children is to 
coach teachers. I would suggest, Sarah, that you think about um, sort of the internal logic of, of that assumption. Can you break that assumption apart? Individualized teacher coaching will yield what? Uh, maybe it will yield um, teachers employing new practices. And when teachers employ new practices, you'll increase child outcomes. So again, that's sort of making explicit what, what you're assuming here. We have another one. I'm not sure if an assumption would be that students can be motivated to engage in general ed classes, for example, or if we can engage students enough to be motivated or care about general ed classes. Does it rest with my actions or the students, for example? So there you've got, yeah, there's some unpacking to do there, Donna, I think, about what the assumption is. Um, it has something to do with engaging kids in general ed classes, and that if you engage students, so, so I'm sort of trying to take this apart a little bit. There are assumptions about you know, whether or not they'll be motivated, um, assumptions about um, engaging kids in courses having, I would imagine that there, there's an assumption there about if kids are engaged in general ed courses, something will happen. Um, maybe their, their, um, their achievement will improve, or um, if they're in general ed classes, their engagement will improve. So you want to unpack that a little bit about what are the assumptions built into into that whole thing. Um, there are valid and reliable multiple measures that could be used effectively for the evaluation of ed performance. Let's take this one as the last one. So the idea here is that there's an assumption here that multiple measures um, to evaluate teachers would yield reliable results, I think, is the assumption there, is that multiple measures could be used effectively to evaluate educator performance. Yes, that is definitely an assumption that's built into all these new evaluation systems, and one you would want to make explicit if you're building a logic model about educator evaluation. So you can see here about this, this being a very generative process, and certainly one that you would want to engage in with you know, a broad range of people who would be affected by the program, the policy, or the initiative that you're trying to implement. So um, on that note, we'll go back to the presentation. and. Um, I am going to turn it over to Shayla. We have completed looking at the elements. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Shayla to now talk us through a little bit of the sort of overarching logic or the progression that runs through logic models. So Shayla, take it away. Thank you, Karen. So I am going to briefly talk about the logic and logic models and the need to understand and identify the possible relationships and connections among various elements of the model. So one way is by understanding the theory embedded in the model through if-then statements. Now, if-then statements indicate how each component relates to each other. So to have good if-then statements will help supply some of the detail missing in a logic model. So they attempt to fill in as many of the critical links in the chain of reasoning as possible. So for example, if resources are available to a program, then program activities can be implemented. And if program activities are implemented successfully, then certain outputs and outcomes can be expected. So understanding this, these uh, if-then statements is, is essential in uh, uncovering the theory of action or theory of change that drives a program of policy. So we're going to look at an example from the blended learning schools case. And as you can see here, if the district invests in blended learning in three schools, then you should see instructions um, that will be personalized and participating students will be more engaged. Now, if instruction is more personalized and the students are more engaged, then there should be an increase in student achievement as measured by standardized assessment. So this kind of gives you a, a simple um, example of, of an if-then statements and how they relate to each other. So what we're going to do now um, is on page 23 in your workbook, we're going to be doing an activity. If you want to follow along in the workbook, it's on page 23. Um, we're going to be doing an activity using some statements from the College Ready program case. So if we can go to um, so on your left hand side, there's a question. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to have some statements, and we're going to have you vote on which statement should come first, and which statement should come second, and so forth. So which one would be the if statement, and then which one would be the then statement. Karen is going to be moving um, the pieces around on the screen um, that's in front of you. We have the statements on there in these blue boxes. And so we're going to go through each 
poll, um, and Karen will be moving along, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about you know, if, if, if it makes logical sense. So here's the first poll. So what is logically the first statement on the overall logic here? when you're thinking about the college ready case. So, so which one of these statements would you think would come first? So we'll take a, a few seconds to see what people are thinking should be the first if statement. So it looks like here a lot of you are saying developing a series of college readiness workshops for parents. That's good. Let's see if there is any others. I think we're, we're, we're heading in the right direction here. We'll give people a couple of few more seconds to see if they, they want to vote. All right. So I think the, the all of you have said so far, we develop a series of college readiness workshops for parents. So if Karen, if you want to move that up. So this is our if statement. We develop a series of college readiness workshops. Now what would be the then statement? So what would logically come after this? If you want to take a vote now, which one, which one would be your second choice? So it looks like we have a couple of some variation here. People are voting that they would recruit parents to participate in the workshops. There's a couple that are saying parents use materials from the workshops to help their students with the application process. And then some who are saying parents will better understand the timelines and demands of the college application process. So I can see where, where some of these responses are, you know, are coming from. So it looks like the majority of you have voted that we will recruit parents to participate in the workshop. So this would seem like, the, it's, yes, it is the logical next progression of, of the if-then statements. You know, you first develop the, the, the workshops, next you have to recruit um, the parents in order to participate in the workshops. You guys are doing really great. So let's move on to our third statement now. We see here that we've developed, if we develop a series of college readiness workshops, then we recruit parents to participate in the workshops. Now, if we recruit parents to participate in the workshops, what would be the third statement? Then what would happen? We have here a lot of you are saying parents better understand the timelines and demands of the college application process. We have one that says parents use materials from the workshops to help their students with the application process. So let's take a look at these. So, so we have the workshops. The parents attend the workshops. What do you think logically is the next progression? Would it be using the materials for the workshops, or would it be more of an understanding of the timelines and demands of the college application process? I'm going to give you another a couple of more seconds to change your vote if you want. We're debating whether it is, you know, parents having a better understanding of the timelines and demands of the college application process or using the materials that they got from the workshops to help their students with the application process. All right, so it looks like here, so the, the, I guess the, the correct answer would be parents using the materials from the workshops to help their students with the application process. So I can see where, where you know, you may, they, they will have a better understanding of the timelines, but I, the next logical step would be for them to use those materials and help their students with the application process. So let's go to our next statement. Now that parents have these materials from the workshops to help their students with the application process, 
then what, what would happen next? What do you think is the next step? So it looks like a lot of people are, are voting that parents have a better understanding of the timelines and demands of the college application process and there's some of you um, that are choosing that students will meet their financial aid and college application deadlines. Let's, I'm going to give you a few more seconds or so to see if you want to change your vote or not. All right, so it looks like the majority of you have chosen that parents better understand the timelines and demands of the college application process, and you are right. Um, that would be the next progression in the if then statements is that parents have a better understanding of the demands and the timelines of the application process. And then finally, our final statement, of course, it's not hard to understand here that, you know, we would want you know, in the end for students to meet their financial aid and college application deadlines because that, that was the whole goal of, of developing the series of, of these workshops is to get parents involved and get them to use those materials and, and to sort of guide and help their, their daughter or son or daughter or, um, to meet the, the college application process and to sort of meet the financial aid and college application deadlines which are very crucial when it comes to the college application process. So, so hopefully this gives you an idea of how if-then statements um, sort of work um, in, within a logic model. So if we can go back, we'll go back now. The idea of this is behind the logic models is to have that sort of logical progression. So some logic models do have if-then statements, but there are logic models models that don't have any if-then statements. So logic models have a, a logic to them and, and sort of have a movement and a progression. And hopefully the activity that we just did kind of gives you, makes you think about the whole logic model and its progression. So now that we have talked about the logic and logic models, um, I'm going to give you a quick review of what we've discussed throughout this webinar. Um, and sort of give you an idea of what we've accomplished so far. Hopefully we have um, achieved all of that. And then um, I'll be handing it over to Karen who's going to be um, talking about next steps. So today, um, as you can see here, we've already um, gone over the logic and logic models and now we're just going to go over the closing and the next steps. So today, hopefully, you know, we, what we did is we discussed the purpose of the logic model and, and sort of how it's a framework for planning and implementation, and we sort of gave you other examples of that. We also presented um, the elements of a logic model, um, which, you know, sort of included that problem statement and the resources. And we also considered the logic embedded in the logic models that talked about the, the if-then statements that we just did and how they help in seeing sort of the logic in the model as well as its progression. So hopefully, you know, we, we were able to give you a better idea of how to, how, what logic models are and how to better um, develop a good logic model for your program or policy. So now I am going to turn it back to Karen, who's going to go over some next steps. Karen? Thank you, Shayla. Uh, so now that we've come to the end of sort of what we wanted to present in terms of the logic models, we wanted to talk a little bit about where you might go from this. And we've been hinting at this as we've gone along. So first of all, you want to think about your next steps uh, in terms of building a draft logic model. I would assume that many of you who are signed on to this webinar uh, are imagining ways that you might work on building a logic model and you have a plan to sort of go forward and start to build one. So, of course, that would be sort of the first step would be to decide. And then we would suggest, as we've indicated, that you engage a, sort of a, a broad range of your key players, your colleagues, potential participants, potential funders, uh, to help you to generate 
the elements of the logic model, to engage in this logic modeling process. Um, and that, that is, you know, someone asked a question about, about, um, about assumptions, but really at the core of it is this, the balance of the logic model process and the logic model product. So you want to be thinking about your process. And with that in mind, um, while you will have many people who are involved in the generation of ideas, you probably need one or two people to serve as the shepherd of the process. You really need to identify someone to, to see it through. And that's sort of a critical piece, piece of, of the logic model process. Now, after you have a draft, you certainly want the input of others. You want other people to chime in and tell you what you got right. Uh, maybe are, are there pieces that, um, that are missing? Are there assumptions that were key assumptions that your group forgot? Um, are there activities that your staff know they do that are, haven't found their way into the core strategies? So again, you want to test out a logic model with the key constituents. Um, there are a number of reasons to do that, not only to ensure that you get it right, but also because you're helping others who are participants in the program, who are members of your organization, to feel that their voices are a part of the process. And you begin to communicate your ideas about the program. You begin to communicate your theory of action as you're developing it. Um, so again, something that you really want to think about is, is opportunities that you have to test out your draft logic model. Uh, and something that we have talked about as well is this idea of the logic model being a living document um, and not something that you put on the shelf, or you frame in your office, or you put in a grant proposal and then you forget about. You really want to think about how you will build the logic model into your program monitoring, into your program implementation. Will you revisit the logic model on a yearly basis as sort of an annual meeting? Will you build an implementation plan around the logic model that you've created? Will you train all new staff on your logic model? So you want to keep thinking about how do you ensure that all this work that you've done, this process that you've engaged in, this document that you've sweated over, how is it going to be a living document? How is it going to um, be a resource for you as you go forward? So as we move to the next step here, we have a few things we'd like you to do. First of all, as indicated in the chat, we want you to evaluate this workshop. We want to know how we did. Um, so we'd really like you to take a moment at the end of the workshop to click on that link and let us know how we did. The feedback is very important to us. And we'd also like to know in the chat pod that you see that says list some of your next steps, tell us one thing that you think you might do um, after this workshop, one thing that you might um, take away from the workshop to use in your work. Um, it would be great for us to know how you're going to use this, this information. That We don't have an opportunity really in the survey to hear how you're going to apply this um, and, and know what your next steps might be. So we'd love to see you tell us uh, what your next steps are. So please take a moment both to complete the survey and to let us know. Um, and you can complete the survey actually when the workshop ends. It'll take you directly to the survey. So the first priority would be here for you to tell us about what your next steps might be. I can see several people are typing. That's great. Um, I certainly hope that there's been something valuable about this. So propose using this exercise when programs are requested. So that's great. So the idea would be to engage in this logic model um, process when, when people talk about developing programs. What about the exercise poll? I'm not sure I know what that is a question about. Maybe Nilfa could provide a little bit more information about that. Draft the logic model to present to the district leadership team. That's great, Mary. And Mary, think about who your team will be that will help you to draft the logic model. Maybe you just bring in three or four people for an initial draft, and then you take it to the leadership team. Maureen, work with our grants office in using logic models as a basis for designing programs and initiatives that, are, that require evaluation as a standard practice. Yes, I would say that certainly um, more and more foundations are asking for logic models as a part of the grant application or suggesting them. So having folks at the district level who design programs and submit, um, submit grants, having a facility with logic models is, is getting more and more important. Uh, develop a draft logic model to improve grant management process. That sounds like a very concrete and, and doable task. Um, think more concretely of the proposed program goals. That's great. Develop a logic model for a professional learning program that she's creating and delivering. That's great. Again, we encourage you to think about who your um, who your colleagues will be with whom you can work, or your participants, or whomever, who can participate in the process with you. Um, so wow, someone's talking about maybe using a logic model in the dissertation. That's a really interesting idea. Uh, create a logic model using the terms and guidelines from this workshop. 
when I begin work on my next education project and will share with others. That's great. Uh, revise the logic model I just developed without the information shared today to ensure it meets all the guidelines. Well, that's great to know that you've gotten something from today that you can apply directly to work that you're doing. Work with several schools to review existing logic models, identify what worked and what didn't, and update. So take the logic models you have and find out how well they're working and if you are using them as, um, as uh, living documents. All right, it looks like we need to go back. We've come to the close of our workshop, so let's go back to the presentation where I just want to say a word about last thoughts and remind you of what you know, we've said before is that these are a tool for program design, implementation, and evaluation, that it's a process. Developing logic models is a process. You should engage stakeholders. They're living documents and should be returned to frequently. And finally, the last thing we'd like to know from you is that logic models are certainly very useful for evaluation and something that you should think about building into your logic model some evaluation. And on that note, we'd like to know from you whether or not you would attend a second workshop if we offered it on logic models as a tool specifically for evaluation design. We have a second workshop that focuses specifically on um, how to use a logic model to support evaluation development. And I can see overwhelmingly people would participate. That is great news. That is very encouraging for us. And we will plan on um, providing this workshop uh, similar to the one we've done today, an hour and a half workshop, a webinar, um, hopefully before the end of this calendar year. So on that note, I think we can go back to the slides just to say thank you. Don't forget to fill out the survey that you have the link here. Um, and if you have any questions about this workshop, do not hesitate to contact me. That's Karen Shackman. And any questions about the REL and the Urban School Improvement Alliance, please contact Andrew. Um, I want to thank you all for participating and being such active participants as we attempt to use this webinar to be as interactive as possible. Um, it's just, it's been great to see so many voices or see so many, you know, quote unquote voices. Uh, and thank you all for participating. Have a great day.